सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली फर्स्ट एपिसोड ऑफ कट दू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड एक्सपेक्टेशन the first word in the year should be about something happy pleasant fun but the fact is we don't determine what the news is we don't we don't decide news should be good bad fun ugly happy unhappy etc etc the news determines itself and the news news also is something that we anticipate that's why if i may remind you the collection of my columns until 2014 published by harper collins was called anticipating india because that's also the job of journalists political journalists in particular to anticipate what's going to what's going to happen this is looking at trends and things not stars not astrology so that is what that is what political journalism is so when i look when i look to 2023 i look at i think about themes that will dominate our political discourse and one of those themes which i suspect will become more prominent as the year passes and and the story that i'm talking about that you might see a lot of in, in 2023 is is some is developing in another holy city that's another temple mosque dispute or temple versus mosque or mosque versus temple dispute that's coming up in the holy city of mathura just over 100 kilometers away from delhi on the way to agra now just as ayodhya was ram janmabhoomi and a mosque built built at the spot which the hindus thought was the place where lord ram was born in mathura also there is a mosque or eidgah built where the hindus think where the hindu community believes that lord krishna was born they believe that that's where that ancient ancient jail stood where kans lord krishna's uncle had jailed his parents because he was afraid that that because he was afraid that lord krishna's mother that is devaki she and her husband vasudev that their children one of their children will kill him so any time they had a child born he had put them in jail any time they had a child born he would kill the child but the last two children survived one lord balaram he survived because he was he was sort of translocated from womb to womb through divine intervention and lord krishna himself he was taken away by vasudev across a flooded yamuna river and delivered in the safety of the household of nanda and yashoda who did not have a child so that is that is what is believed and you know what in these cases history intersects faith and when history intersects faith it becomes a very difficult issue to resolve either either for historians or for spiritualists religious leaders or even for the courts so ultimately many of these get reduced at least in our country into property disputes that this is a place this is the piece of land where a mosque or a temple stand or one should have stood the other got uh, got destroyed something stood there earlier and then courts are handed over the responsibility of dealing with this now one such thing was ayodhya and we know that background we also know that 1991 parliament passed a law you will see the full name of the law on my screen and that law protected then every other place of religion in india as it existed in 1947 to be left untouched here on untouched in terms of rival claims or any changes in in their nature in terms of who goes and prays there except with the exception of ayodhya because that was an ongoing dispute and you know what happened in ayodhya in 1992 now there was a presumption after that law was passed that after this every other place of worship which is disputed particularly those that are disputed by the hindu community based on their beliefs that it was the muslim rulers mostly mogal but muslim rulers who destroyed famous hindu temples standing in that place and built mosques instead to humiliate the hindu community 
and to assert the Muslim dominance in medieval times. In medieval times, history is replete with examples of desecration of places of worship of any faith being used by victors of the other faith to show their dominance. Sometimes it was also done within the same faith to show the dominance of one king over the other. So one king attacked the other and after defeating him and after defeating him desecrated his most important temple or deity. So those things have also happened. So this was this was stuff that happened in medieval era. But you know what? In the medieval era, it was Muslim dynasties which ruled India for a very long time. So a lot of these stories in our history for about 700 years involved the Muslims of one side, particularly, particularly in Northern India, Hindi heartland, etc., etc., or what might be broadly described today, the region between Ganga and the Jamna River. So you had Ayodhya, which is on the banks of the Saryu, which ultimately goes and meets Ganga. Then you had Varanasi, which is on the banks of the Ganga, and that is where Kashi Vishwanath Temple and Gyan Vyapi Mosque dispute has been simmering for quite some time, and we saw some new things happen there. Not long ago, when the court there ordered a survey of the mosque side to see if there were some elements of the temple still there, if that structure in the tank there was a fountain, at the, as the Muslim side claimed, or a shivalingam, or there were some other statues on one of the walls of the temple. So that survey has been going on and that controversy is on. And that's been in courts. In the middle of the, all this, on 24th of December, court in Mathura. It's the court of Judge Sonika Burma, civil judge 3, who ruled on 24th of December in response to an application by a Hindu group that claims that the mosque there or the Eidgah has been built on land that legally belongs to the Hindu side. She ordered a survey to be carried out there and report submitted to the court. So her order, I will read to you in Hindi. She is judge Sonika Verma, civil judge 3 in Mathura. And, and, and her order is in Hindi. Adalat Amin ko adeshit kiya jata hai. That means the court uh, superintendent in a way uh, is, is ordered. Adalat Amin ko adeshit kiya jata hai. Ke ubhay paksh, that is both sides. Ubhay paksh ko suchit karte huye vivadit sthal ka nirikshan kar apni Akhyame Manchitra Niyat Tithi Tak Nyayale Me Prastut Karna Nishchit Kare. This is to this is an instruction to her court official that the court official, after informing both sides, the plaintiffs as well as the respondent, should carry out a survey of the disputed site. So for the first time, the expression disputed site has been has been brought in vis-a-vis the Mathura issue and this, has been, and this has been done under a judicial order. So he should carry out a survey and draw a map of the place and present it to court. So far only this has happened. Now I can tell you more about the history of the place or what is believed to be the history of the place and I will in a couple of minutes. But I want to explain first of all what does it mean for politics. What it means for politics is watch how the BJP works. BJP does not fight battle where the battle is taking place. The BJP usually lights a fire someplace very far away because these are hyper-connected times. And once, once you have something that can light up people's emotions, then it doesn't matter where elections are taking place. So when the elections were taking place in Uttar Pradesh, you saw all this tension over hijab in Karnataka schools. I call them schools, people say colleges, but they're really secondary schools. They're class 11 and 12. So that controversy played out in Uttar Pradesh elections. It had very little, little to do with Karnataka. Nothing was happening in Karnataka. Now, this year, the most, the next most important election the BJP will face this year will be in Karnataka. And in some ways, it might be the most important state election of the year. One, because that is the one state where Congress party is today in a position of unseat the BJP, defeat the BJP, because BJP is quite weak. They are given how badly, badly their government is run. So BJP needs some emotive issues in Karnataka, because in Karnataka, their formula is polarization. Just as in UP, their formula were polar, was polarization. So what they did in Karnataka at that point, that helped 
with what was happening in Uttar Pradesh. And similarly, this is Uttar Pradesh. If this lights up, this emotion lights up in, in, in Uttar Pradesh in Mathura, that might have an echo in faraway Karnataka. As I told you, this is a hyper-connected world. That's why I suspect you will see and you will hear a lot more of this controversy as the year goes ahead. Because after that, other states will go to the polls, Telangana, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan. There are some North northeastern states where this will not matter so much. But for all those, this will continue to be an issue because, because this will be the new talk point. Earlier, it was Ayodhya. Then it was Varanasi and stuff is happening around Varanasi. Also in Varanasi, the other major thing has happened. So just as you see in Ayodhya, uh, the BJP governments are now building this large temple. And also there is an upgrade of the city. So what will happen in the process is, first of all, the mosque is not there. That mosque will be built, built elsewhere. But even where the mosque is there, the mosque is intact and untouched, at least untouched by anybody with any ulterior intentions or motives. Say in Varanasi, the mosque is intact and safe. But the structures around it, around it, the whole compass has been built in a way that the mosque has got dwarfed. So the mosque is there, but, mo but the mosque does not, does not dominate the skyline. It is the temple and the structures around the temple, the new structures, the walk from the river to the temple, etc. That dominate the whole area. And it's quite likely that something like this might be in store for Mathura as well. Because in this time and age, to imagine that mosque that's been there for a very long time could be demolished as was done in Ayodhya in 1992. Because 30 years have now passed since 1992, since the destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya. And now degree of difficulty in any such thing has become much higher. So it does look like, and this is an analytical point, not opinion, an analytical point that now it looks like that the new method is to let the mosque be there, but just make the temple and the structures around the temple so grand and so visible as to as to make that the main attraction or main visible religious symbol at that spot. And it looks like Mathura may be headed the way of Varanasi as well. But that is a bit of guesswork. Now let's look at what is the legal situation and what exactly is happening. So the judge right now has not given any view on on who owns what, what happened. And let me try and explain to you where does this land dispute comes, on, comes from. So first of all, first of all, 1669, go back to 1669, this is Aurangzeb at his prime. 1669, he destroys the temple in Banaras, Kashi Vishwanath temple. 1670, he destroys the temple in Mathura. Now this is something which we also have on the authority of good historians like say Richard Eaton of University of Arizona. So if you go to his two articles in Frontline magazine and we'll share a page from those articles with you and we'll also try and share the whole link if those editions of Frontline are on, on internet. He also records that in 1670 Aurangzeb destroyed the temple in Mathura. Then there was a bit of a spree of temple destruction in that geographical region. So 60, 1669 was Banara, 1670 was Mathura, 1679 was Jodhpur, 1680 was Udaipur, 1680 was Chittor. Again, not far from, from Udaipur. Generally in the same direction. So obviously he was moving in that direction and, and, and all this stuff was happening around that time. So this is a historical fact that he demolished the temple. He probably built a mosque there. There are some records there. He likely built a mosque there. But after that, many things happened. But I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the temple that Aurangzeb destroyed, again, if you look at historical records, it looks like the original temple at, at Mathura had been destroyed and rebuilt many times. So it does seem, it does seem from historical records that in 1618, that is, that is, 52 years before Aurangzeb destroyed the temple, this temple was built by a Bundela ruler, by Raja Veer Singh Bundela in 1618. So this is the temple, the temple Aurangzeb destroyed was a temple built by Raja Veer Singh Bundela. Now some mentions of this incident also appear in the accounts of Nicola Manucci, who was an Italian traveler in India at that point of time and also spent some time in Aurangzeb's court. So he wrote an account called Storiado Mogar. Mogar, I presume, is Mughal. 
So he wrote an account. I don't know what is the fiction element to his account because we know that Marco Polo and Kublai Khan, Marco Polo and Kublai Khan added quite a bit of his own exaggeration and stuff to his account. But that was a few hundred years earlier. So we can maybe make a presumption that since this was several hundred years after Marco Polo, this might be less embellished with fiction and romance than Marco Polo's accounts. Yet, yet this was the medieval time. So you can't say that this, this would be completely factual. But there is a mention of the destruction of the temple in Mathura in Nicola Manucci's accounts. But this didn't end there. Aurangzeb ruled from 1658 to 1707. About 60 plus years after that, exactly 63 years after that, it was the Marathas who swept northern India and who swept the Mughal power aside. Remember, after that, they had the third battle of Panipat where they fought Ahmad Shah Abdali. That was deep inside what is today's Haryana. That was at Panipat. So 1770, Marathas defeated Mughal power, drove them out of Mathura and rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the temple, but 1803, the British defeated the Marathas. As the British defeated the Marathas, they took over the temple site. They thought there was some value to this land. You know, that's what East India Company was like. If East India Company had half a chance, history tells us, they would have even sold off the Taj Mahal, which would have been broken down and then sold off for the marble in the rubble. That didn't happen. So they also took this as a piece of land which had some value and they put this land on auction. In the auction, this land was bought by a Raja of Banaras called Raja Patnimal. Raja Patnimal bought this land, but there were many disputes. Many cases were filed by Muslim groups and this litigation went on for more than a hundred years. Now the Hindu side in their petition in the court claims that usually the courts ruled in Raja Patnimal's favor. In 1932, Allahabad High Court also ruled in his favor. It so happens that his descendants in 1944 sold this land to a Hindu group, to a group of Hindu Mahasabha. And this was Hindu Mahasabha members who are quite well known. They were all prominent leaders, Madan, Madan Mohan Malviya, Goswami Ganesh Dath, Bikin Lalji Atre. So they bought, they bought this land for 13,444 rupees from the descendants of Raja Patnimal. And they were funded, this purchase was funded by Jugal Kishore Bidla. You know Bidla, you know the Bidla family, the famous Bidla family. They were, they, they've been, they've made a big contribution to building temples, resurrecting temples, etc. So they, they, they gave them this 13,444 rupees to buy this land. 1957, the Bidla set up a trust. It was called Shri Krishna Janbhumi Trust where the deed of the land was transferred. So the deed of the land by these buyers, by Hindu Mahasabha, funded by the Bidlas, was transferred to this trust. This trust, in the course of time, went defunct in 1958, which is when Radha Krishna Dalmia, R.K. Dalmia, built this temple. That is the temple in the name of Lord Krishna that, stay, that stands there now. That is also called Katra Keshav Dev Temple. That temple stands there now. In fact, the whole locality, the whole area, 13.7 acres, is in Mathura, generally called Katra Keshav Dev. Keshav, as you know, is also one of the synonyms for Lord Krishna. In 1958, Sri Krishna Janmstan Seva Sangh was formed. In the 1970s, its name changed a little bit. So instead of Seva Sangh, it became Seva Sansthan. Now that becomes important, important because the Muslim kept because the Muslims kept on laying claims to large parts of this land, and that litigation went on. In 1968, in the court, an agreement was signed between the Idga Committee and also Sri Krishna Janstan Seva Sansthan, in which a part of that land was given to the Muslim side, and it was it was seen to be a good peaceful settlement to the problem. The current petitioners say that this agreement was wrong, this arrangement was wrong, that the side that handed over this land to the Muslims was not authorized to do so because, because the caretaker of the deity, because in Hindu tradition there is, there is the concept of the deity being a living being, but a minor living being, so there has to be a local guardian or a caretaker or a shibet as it's called, or, or a shibet as the expression goes. So that, that right belonged to the trust formed by the Bidlas in Hindu Mahasabha earlier. 
this Sansthan did not have the authority to make this deal. And that is why they've gone to court saying that this deal was illegitimate in 1968. So this land should be taken back from the Muslim side. And to take that land back, this Eidgah has to be demolished. And to take that land back, this Eidgah has to be demolished. Also, it has to be de demolished because you know what? Garbhgraha, the exact place where Lord Krishna was born. So the belief goes that this is where Kansa's jail was located. And in the jail, in, in a basement, they had set up a Garbhgraha for Devki to deliver her babies there and Lord Krishna was delivered there. So that is where the mosque is built. So in the temple that you see, if you see this picture, you see a temple and a mosque. So petitioners say this is not the temple we want. This is a temple built by human beings, well-meaning human beings, well-meaning Hindus, much later by R.K. Dalmi and others. But this is not where the Garbhgraha is. That temple also has a Garbhgraha. But the petitioners say that is not the real Garbhgraha, that is just a mock Garbhgraha. The real one is where the mosque is located. So demolish the mosque, hand the land over to the Hindu side and let a new temple be built on top of that Garbhgraha as has happened in Ayodhya. Now once again, will it happen? Will it not happen? Will something else happen? Will a variation of what's happened in Varanasi happen? We can all hazard a guess and these guesses are hazardous. So I'm not so I'm not so I'm not being so reckless. All I can tell you is that through this year, 2023, as so many important states go to the polls, you will hear about Mathura again and again and again. Because you know what? Politics also is like a game of pool or billiards or whatever you call it, where you hit one ball with the intention of pocketing another. And that's how this politics is played. So election will be in Karnataka, action is here. And then later elections will take place closer home, closer home to Mathura. So Rajasthan is next door, Madhya Pradesh is not so far. And then Chhattisgarh also comes into play. So definitely this year and who knows, even next year, as India goes towards general elections, there will be a live buzz around this story. And that's the reason I thought, just anticipating the news and headlines and our discussion points. And that's why I thought that Mathura was a good discussion point to start this year's series of Karta Clatter.